I thought she wasn't going to get up here. I know. She was, was talking to Nick for so long. Out. I loved it. Um, hey, everyone. So, so as I told you in the bathroom, I've given you a list of very predictable questions, but... Um, Hardly I, predictable. I, <laughs> I am going to go off script because I like to do that, but I do want to start with one of the predictable questions. Uh, I always love to hear kind of the genesis behind a company and how it got started. You started with a obviously a powerful celebrity who, who brought a lot of meaning behind the development of these brands and you had four founders total but how did um how did the company get started and what was the original idea and yeah I'll, I'll, it, it's nice to paint a bit of the back picture and the context of the of the global consumer products arena because that's in a world where we're putting things in on and around our bodies every single day you there's a idea that you're outsourcing your trust to the brands or the or product companies. But at the end of the day, they don't prioritize your health. They don't think about um, your overall health and wellness when it comes to, especially your children. And so I'm in environmental science by training and was in the NGO space for over a decade. And ultimately, what I was doing was taking the data out of um, science and research and academia and trying to popularize that, translating that. So what the environment is doing to our bodies, what it's doing inside of us. The environment is inside of us. Our babies are born. I have four kids. Those of you who have ki uh, kids in the audience, you have children that are born pre-polluted. So we're asking to scare the audience. I'll scare the audience. We're, there are 287 chemicals coursing through their veins on average, and that's only assessing for the 400 most top popular. And in a world where chemicals and ingredients are ubiquitous, the marketplace is over 85,000. So less than 1% have ever been tested for human health. And we're living in a world where the World Health Organization says that there's a global health threat when it comes to endocrine disruption. So these products that are ingredients that are essentially hacking our endocrine systems and causing disease states. And so backstory is let's write a book that makes this understanding of the science, especially to parents who are the most willing to take action on behalf of a newborn child, equal parts moments of fear and paralysis and moments of awakening. And how do you, get, how do you engage them in a way that is a positive, proactive message? And so I wrote a book, and Jessica Alba comes to the book launch party called Healthy Child, Healthy World, and she's, she's seven months pregnant, and she's like every other parent that says, I had a horrible allergic reaction, or I have something, I have eczema, or I have allergies, or I have, I have a child with behavioral disorders. God forbid you have someone who has epidemic um, diabetes or childhood cancers that are all rising to these scary proportions. And she says, tell me what to buy. And that's the consumer marketplace. Guide me, hold my hand, and really help me understand what is better, what is safer, what is raising the bar when it comes to the health of my children. And uh, navigating the marketplace, which was my job at this nonprofit, is incredibly hard to do. And so we just asked the question, can we do it better? Can we actually create a standard? Can we look at the RAWs? and go down to the parts per billion, which is a drop, a, an eyedropper into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So, so can you drive so deep in the science and toxicology and understand what's inside? So eating the pill that tells you what's inside and what's going on with your health, can you understand what's inside your product? Because you, know, you put, well, in this industry, you put flavors, but in the personal care products industry, you put fragrance. It's a Trojan horse of chemicals. I, I guarantee you, you don't know what's inside your, your flavors. So how do you know if that's impacting the health of your end consumer? So the concept was create the higher standard, start with a portfolio that the parents and people are most actively using, diapers, cleaning products, personal mm -hmm. care. And that was in 2012. Uh, and that was 17 products. Now we have our 125 products in six different categories. Everything from beauty to personal care to, again, household and... Um, so, but 17 products is a lot to uh, launch a, with right a, off on it, day one. It's a big, it's a big launch. Oh, because ultimately you're telling the story of, I've done the work, I'm the weekend toxicologist, I'm your piece of mind play, right. and I've done the work so you don't have to worry about it. I'm your source bank. And... So, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, it's still 17 is a lot. I can see why you, you must have come up with a core list, but to launch day one, that's a lot of work for yeah, a company that's just starting. It was, it was a nights and weekends project. It literally was called the Honest Project. Uh, and 
to source and batch and find the commands that were willing to go to your level of standards of, we talked about traceability and sourcing and who, who's going to make it. The big guys, BASF, DuPont, Dow, they have tremendous innovations in green chemistry centers. They're just not asked to open those doors. Mm. So if you push with them, if you work with them, if you collaborate and you can source those raws, you can build anything. Right. So you and I, when we first met, we talked about having Honest as your brand name, kind of obviously creating a, a pretty significant standard for future performance and quality. How has that played? I mean, in some ways, I would think it's put sort of a target on your back, too, for people that want to either compete against you or, or bring the company down a bit. I would say it's a target on our chest. And um, we didn't call ourselves Honest Company or an, an honest company, we called ourselves the honest company. So we're essentially asking for, it's audacious, asking for the criticism, asking for the conversation. Mm. But that's the intention. The intention is, uh, you know, we're, we, we are, our greatest asset is trust. If you bring that to the bottom line, it's our thesis and our idea that's worth millions and billions of dollars. But ultimately, it's that service relationship is is, is uh, built on that level of currency of trust. And so you, you insert the word honest, you, you create a conversation, you open up right. dialogue. It's not, we're the perfect company. No, we're doing our work to do more. And uh, it goes back to the values, it goes back to the principles, it goes back to the transparency, but it also goes back to the science, ultimately grounded in the integrity of the science of the product. So you must have had some moments though where you didn't quite live up to that standard. Yeah, I would, I would say that in a few instances, we didn't live up to the standard, and you, you have to ask for forgiveness. You have to overly communicate. Um, we have over 65 customer service reps embedded in the headquarters, which was right down here in Playa, and they are, they are churning through six to 8,000 touch points a day with a consumer. So it's social and live chat and email and phone calls, and they are there to be the sounding board. They're there to ask questions, and they're also there to say, hey, we're sorry, or how can we help you, or mm. we'll, we'll do better next time. It's, it's played itself out in the media, probably, probably in most often in a grandiose type of way. So how, how has the Honest Company changed your competition, and how have they reacted to the Honest Company? I, I don't think it's we've changed the competition. I think the consumer, there's a consumer mandate and that consumer mandate is asking for, especially the, the, the power of the green marketplace, the power of the mom's voice, and the power of her wallet mm. in order to really dictate what's on store shelf. And you look at every major retailer from Target to Walmart to Whole Foods, they're p coming up with their own chemical policies because one here in the United States doesn't exist. Mm. There's no government regulation to do any pre-market safety testing of anything that's hitting store shelves. So again, it's the onus on the brand, and you have the marketplace shifting. I mean, where everyone else in CPG is growing 2%, if that, that's a great year, mm. we're growing triple digits year over year. So right. that, that, is a, that is a demonstration of what they want and, and what they're really demanding. Okay. I talked a little bit at the beginning of the session today about how hard it is to, for small brands to stay aligned with their original mission and values. How, how, what have the struggles been for the four of you founders to one, stay aligned among the four of you, yeah. and then stay aligned while you've had to take multiple rounds of money from VC firms and, uh, and all the competitive pressures? There is a undoubted, in any brand, there's an undoubted friction between missionary and mercenary. Who do you serve? Who's, your, who's ultimately um, your final end consumer? Is it, is it the brand and your ethos in the future, or is it your bottom line? And that ex has existed internally in a, in a major way at Honest. I would say that Jessica and I really are the, the holders of that North Star, mm -hmm. and playing true to this idea that we want to be a global iconic consumer brand. Um, and that lifestyle and that, that um, the boldness of that vision is hard to execute every single day. So you have Sean and, and Brian, who are other two co-founders who have subsequently exited the business, because that friction is too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're in year five, going on year six in January, and it is a slowdown to recalibrate. 
understand who the people at the table. How do you how do you trade up on some of the other executives at the at the at the um, table as well, and understand what you're trying to accomplish in the long run. I mean, four founders is a, that's, no, a, that's a big number. It's impossible. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I do not I do not recommend it at all. I would say, um, but it's certainly every single person. I would say the first two years a phenomenal. Everyone took their own um, arena and went with it. And, and then and you soon, had defined and skill defined sets roles. and areas and and then soon the the working the seams becomes quite difficult right and uh, that's when you find collisions and challenge so talking about mission and I, I i just wanted this is a warning that i read this on wikipedia when i was doing some research so it might not be right but um but it said your mission it was really much very much about driving a healthier life but it was also driving a, a happier life is is that has that been a part of the mission going forward or is it just tied yeah. into the healthy part yeah, I mean, look, uh, being the science guy, I would say that in order to um, in order to really execute against the happiness, you have to live a healthy life, right? That's everyone mm -hmm. believes that is true. It's your greatest wealth, but the brand had never really talked about product in the mission. Mm -hmm. um, the goal was to build this healthier, happier life, but in a way where the consumer is only going to reach a level of happiness if they are feeling that there is a level of trust and relationship there and that passion and integrity is the bedrock of that relationship and it's mm -hmm. consistent over time um, people consumers will flee quite quickly as soon as that trust bond is broken and so we are that it, it, is, it is stewarded and garnered in everything we do mm -hmm. and a lot of it is uh, you know in working that relationship and working that um, purpose it is, it's demonstrated through the product, but it's demonstrated in small action. So what's your tone of voice and what's your POV and wh wh how are you articulating that in, in the smallest of details away, on the vanity sheet, on the bottom of the box, on, on the small print on the label, all that stuff really matters. So how, um, how important has Jessica's role and her voice and her ability to reach consumers quickly and in a, in a big way. How much did that contribute to your, your early success? Yeah, there, there's no doubt she's an X factor. She has um, a, she, amplifying and, and garden, she's flypaper, right? She gets people to get sticky and excited, <laughs> but people, consumers will quickly leave if there's the, the, the realness of the product or the product won't hold up over time. And she, but she, she's there every day. She's incredibly passionate. She can articulate the message very well. She's an cr incredible study of business and people. Mm. Um, and, and she's wanting to really see this out. I think she sees this as her legacy and has used her, her prehistory here to, um, or her history to really inform where she is as a mother and a parent mm. and as a business person. And where she's wanted the brand to go. Right. Okay, so I want to go back to, to your money sources. Yeah. And um, you know, obviously with a mission-driven company, who you take money from I think is even more important than, than anything else. Um, how have you gone about it? Um, how have you chosen the VC firms that you've taken money from? Yeah. And how tough has it been to find investors that really truly believe in your mission beyond just the initial check? They're going into it, again, this is the summer of 2011 that we first hit the road and, and went up to Silicon Valley. And the, the request was, this is patient capital. This is, this is not to get in, get out. This is not try to sell the business. Although every major competitor has knocked at the door, this is something that we, are, we see a long-term vision for. Those, the selection process around the VCs was, are they willing to understand this is a brand play and a platform play, this is mm -hmm. not a technology play, although we have a direct-to-consumer business that's well over 65% of the, of the pipeline. Um, are they willing to see that through? And um, I, I do have to say that, again, rolling into year six here, there is not anxiety in the room, but mm -hmm. tell, show me how this is going to actualize. I would say a $300 million plus business right now is quite successful. Um, based on the return on their investment, but ultimately they're looking at w where what's the next five years looking like, and that's look to get the 300. That's hard to get to 600. You know, not even Much harder. Exponentially harder. 
So we are, I think we're doing, right now we're in this, again, this reacclimation and reconception phase to understand what's that step function going forward. And, uh, and, the, and, those, and all the people at the table, both VC and some institutional investors in private equity, they all, they're buying into that larger play because we haven't even taken this thing global. Hmm. The global opportunities for this brand are tremendous. And so that's what I think we're most excited about. But I would think as a mission-driven company, the, the range of potential exit acquirers gets down to a smaller list too. And I'm not saying <laughs> you're thinking about it, but down the road as you look at it, um, I, I would think then the number of companies that can fit based on your mission is not all that big of a list. Well, look, uh, we really, at the end of the day, we're a raw ingredients company. Right? How pure are your raws? How great are your formulations? Are, are the results within the products there? And can the consumer depend on them? The mission is the, the outer wrapping and the veneer of the, the product. The product is, is your core. So can they, does an acquirer or does someone, um, uh, um, um, a merger type of relationship, does that strategic understand the core of that consumer and the marketplace, yes. Mm. The natural, non-toxic, organic marketplace that we play in and, and quite, quite candidly are driving, we're the, they want to be in that space. There's way too green fields of opportunity and green shoots of growth there that they want to play in that space. So um, yes, we, we talk about ourselves as a mission with a company as opposed to a company with a mission, but you know, th they realize that this is, there is, too many good opportunities in that, in that marketplace right. going forward. I want to ask you one more question, and then I want to open it up to the floor for some questions. Um, Layla wanted me to ask you a little bit about the beverage industry. And okay. you're, you're obviously, because of a few people at Coke, you're, uh, you're not really able to come out with an honest uh, beverage. But uh, Yeah, we, ha we have a coexist with those guys, unfortunately. Because <laughs> otherwise, I'd be in that category. So how do you look at the beverage industry what are some of your favorite brands what appeals to you about the beverage industry uh wow some of my favorite i am a, layla knows that i'm a kombucha fanatic i tried home brew i i probably have tried well over 35 different brands um i and I, i'm just fascinated with that space the probiotic and fermented space is really interesting to me I, I think the beverage space in particular is, is such a, it's, you know, it's, it's a test and learn, and now you can have the, all these micro, small, regional brands really having a nice little, uh, a really play in their own little marketplace. And I, I think that's, that's the exciting piece. I think that what still gets my heart aching is this idea that you're shipping some type of liquid water around in the country. And, and the sustainability and the footprint piece of that, I would love to have a deeper conversation on solving that. And I, I, I look at, um, and certainly the outer packaging, like what's the package, what is it leaching, how is it holding it, how is it being, uh, you know, what are some of the sanitization protocols on it, I, you know, all of that needs to be discussed. But as far as I'm concerned, I think the beverage industry for, for um, uh, macro trends around adaptogenics and fermented foods is just green field, like tons of opportunity there. Great. So any questions? From the audience, Townsend. Talk a little more about your trademark. And you started to answer it with the limitations with Coke. But yeah. You're in six categories. You might want to be in 12. Is it for all? I mean, what? Just talk about how you trademarked it and the applicability by category. Yeah. So it was a, it was a late night uh, wine session with at Jessica's house in 2009. They were like, oh my God, honest. We keep coming back to this word of honest. Let's see what the world of IP and trademark is in there. And this is when Honest Tea, small brand, regionally uh, based in the or East, East Coast and, and Northeast, and hadn't had a any connectivity with Coca-Cola at that time. I know Seth well, and nothing was there. So uh, we essentially did all the buying around every single category and started registering this idea of this, the Honest Company in those categories. As soon as we launched, you know, six months later, Coca-Cola had the lion's share of, of of honest tea and knocked on a door and said, hey, time for a coexist because you're not gonna go into Bev and you're not gonna go into kids. Sadly, because there was a ton of optionality for this brand there. We won't go there, we'll create a sub-brand if we, we do have interest there. But the word, you know, the word is such an opportunity to um, really build in categories that, 
in my opinion, you know, do I have an opinion on the built environment and what's inside your, your nursery and what's, what's inside your car? Absolutely. So, you know, from a design perspective, yes. From a health perspective, yes. From an ingredient perspective, absolutely. From an innovations and technology perspective, yes. So the extensibility of the brand started in the 17 products, but broadened very quickly because I never wanted to be known as the diaper company or the liquid soap company or the tea company. So again, trust portfolio across a broad array and allow the brand to um, have optionality in the future. Could you talk about sourcing? Just take one example, let's say diapers. Great. Who makes them for you? How do you get the quality you want? I won't tell you who makes them, but I can tell oh, you about quality. <laughs> okay. You can tell. We'll go there. So <laughs> Ontex makes them for us. They're a, a player out of uh, Europe and Belgium in particular. Global player. Ultimately, it's how do you define the chassis? How do you understand what the raws are? Where are you sourcing your pulp? The inner, in, inside of the non-woven of a diaper is pulp, and that's your absorbent core. And how do, you, how do you pull that liquid and hold that liquid is all based on super absorbent polymers. So if you can do that well and better than the next guy, so ours are anywhere between 20 to 40% more absorbent than what's sitting on store shelves. And we have this beautifully printed back sheet. So you do it with, you get mom's attention. Oh my God, they're so cute. And they really work, right? You have one time to hold the baby's business. Otherwise, mom's moving very quickly. So do that really well. We knew that the diaper was key. Sitting on your baby's genitalia for 24 hours a day for 363, you know, 36 months. Make sure it's safe and non-toxic. No, <laughs> those are going to be called honestly. And no, we're not doing adult yet. Um, yeah, if you didn't have the X factor in Jessica, I'm interested from a marketeer's point of view, what would have been your plan B and how do you think it would have affected your growth? I, you know, G Je again, Jessica is the X factor that drives someone's head to lift. And, but is she going to actually get someone to pull the money out of their wallet? And I don't believe she does. I believe that the, the, integrity of the product, I believe the efficacy of the product, and I believe that the, the larger mission platform and, and commitment to purpose and integrity when it comes to the product, that is what gets people to stay. Yes, she probably attracts 30%, 40% of people to look and listen, but there is a, um, there is a reality against that mom consumer set that once she has found something and once she is in the know, you know, we, we built for that passionate few and the lukewarm many are going to come, right? It's the bonfire. You have a small bonfire and it will get bigger because you get passionate people. And I believe that that passion was around, here's a brand, here's amazing product, and they're just doing it better. And it's, again, it's not best, it's slightly better. And I, th I think people can buy into that, especially that mom set. But is there a specific channel that's working the best for you right now? Uh, direct, online. Um, you, you, know, you could control the message. We do it really well. Like, there's a concierge type of experience when you, they come in and they're members and what they get. And I mean, I call 30 members a week, right? I call 10 that are really pissed off at us, 10 that are brand new, and that 10 that are super loyal. And to get that mom on the phone, she's, she's like obnoxiously ex excited. But she just wants to commune and communicate and talk and possibly inform. I mean, we use that customer service group as a massive listening channel. I mean, they help drive innovation and product pipeline. So um, they, are, they are a huge asset of ours. Well, I was going to ask about that. How do you drive innovation and how do you think about new product launches? beyond the original 17? Yeah, I mean, look, baby, beauty, and then the beyond category, but the baby and the beauty are winning for us in a massive way. Uh, the Honest Beauty set, which is exper experience really around feminine, feminine care and feminine beauty, that is an area of ripe opportunity. I mean, the average woman walks out of the house of, with 197 synthetic chemicals on her face alone. You know, again, less than 1% have ever been tested for human health and safety. And, and then we wonder why breast cancer, you biopsy breast, breast cancer cells, and 99% of them have parabens and phthalates and these harsh preservatives in them. Why, you know, and people wonder where the correlation is. And, and you've got all these 
anti-breast cancer campaigns. campaigns by the major guys, which they're exacerbating and possibly even causing. So let's, let's really step back and understand, like, when we look at the pipeline, where are these ripe opportunities and where's, where are the dirtiest industries? Like, where, where can we have an opinion that innovation and gets And I better? assume there's still plenty of dirty industries to go after. Quite a few. So I, ha I hate to ask about regrets, but, but what are the big lessons learned, you know, starting from that wine with Jessica in 2009? What are the, what are the things you look back on and maybe would have wanted to do differently? Um, I would have never moved to Playa Vista. We were, <laughs> we were here in Santa Monica and we had a, smite, a small, tight, incredible, it was like a beehive and people were sitting this close to each other and that kinetic energy am amongst the culture was really, really powerful. And we went to a stacked environment, stunning space, but you lose that essence and that verve and that excitement. Um, and I would say that hurt and harmed culture. And, and look, the, your people are your greatest asset. And I think that that harmed us. Um, and I, what else would I have done? I would have probably thought more carefully around the founding relationships and how many and what the dynamics were there. Um, but, you know, we're all friends and we're all passionate followers and advocates of each other now. So um, nothing, no harm, no foul. But the team needs focus early and they can't hear from four mouths because you're not going to get the same message unless you're incredibly synced. Any other questions? Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it.